before. So the, the coffee break is back at four on the schedule. Um, so uh, the exercise session is from two to three thirty, but the, since the room is booked until four, you can stay over and the coffee break starts at four anyway. Um, and the second one is that the group discussion for women and gender minority is on the terrace, like where we did the icebreakers yesterday and not in the Adriatico Terrace like it was in the program before. Okay? So let's start. So I will be talking about measure preserving transformations. And before transformations. But first, I would do a bit of a recap of the, um, the things from the lecture from yesterday that I will need in my class. So X for me would always be a metric space, or, well, it could also be a topological space for most of the things I'll say, and most of the time it will be either 0, 1, or S1, or the things we've been looking at so far. So from yesterday, we know that XB is a measurable space. If so X is our metric space, and B is a sigma algebra of sets that I remind you that it means that it contains the empty set, and uh, if it contains a set, then it contains its complement, and also if it contains a um, countable number of, of sets, then it contains its, its union. And, and those are called the measurable sets. And a nice sigma algebra that we often use is B, the Borel sigma algebra, that is the smallest sigma algebra containing open sets. And then on, on a measurable space, we can put a measure that is a function from the set of uh, measurable sets into R plus union infinity, such that the measure of the empty set is zero, and if we have a countable union of sets, of measurable sets that are pairwise dis disjoint, then the measure of their union is the sum of the measure of those sets. Um, and then we will call X B with the measure mu a measured space. A measured space. So a measurable space is a space on which we can put a measure because we have a collection of sets that are ready to um, have a measure put on. And, and then we had the extension theorem. I need a bigger chalk. That tells us that giving a measure on an algebra of set determines uniquely uh, the 
measure. On the sigma algebra generated by this algebra. So we don't want to, um, to say what the measure of every set is, but it is enough to give it on an algebra, so on, on finite unions, and then it, it extends to a measure on all measurable sets. And I want to give you an example of a measure that I will use. So if we have a function from an interval to R plus, so a positive function that is integrable for Norman, normal Riemann integrable, then if I take a subinterval, I can define the measure of the subintegral to be a uh, subinterval, sorry, to be the integral of f of x. And now the measure of the empty set is, uh, is zero because we are integrating over nothing. And then the measure of the total space, our interval i is uh, finite because f is integrable. And if we have disjoint, uh, disjoint subintervals, then um, it satisfies additivity and so on. And uh, so since the, the set of finite union of intervals is, a, is an algebra, we can apply the extension theorem, uh, which tells you that mu f extend to a measure on B of A, on, on B that is the Borel sigma algebra. Okay, because uh, the Borel sigma algebra is given by countable unions of intervals. And this we call a measure defined by the density f. And we call it like that because basically f is giving a weight to each point um, in my interval. So I'm saying that um, it's a density because if, if we have a space with particles on it, for example, and the particles are more dense in a part of the interval, then this integral will be bigger. So given a positive function, we, uh, this can give us a measure on our space. Okay, so this is what I will need from measure theory. And now we pass to transformations. So we fix space X with its measurable sets and its measure. So I measure space. And then we say definition that T, a transformation from X to X is measurable. if for each subset, subset measurable set, then the pre-image of A is still measurable. And so this is first definition and second definition, T is measure preserving If 
Well, first, we want T to be measurable. And second, um, so we want the, the measure of T to the minus one of A to be exactly the measure of A for each A that is measurable. So what we're saying is that we have our space and we have the measurable set. And if we take one of those measurable sets, we can pull it back, we can take its pre-image in X, and we want this uh, new set, first of all, to be measurable, and then once it's measurable, we can calculate its measure. And it preserves the measure in the sense that when we go back, we still have the same measure. Okay? So, first some remarks. So, the second point of my definition doesn't make sense. without the first, because I can't take the measure of the pre-image unless the pre-image is also measurable. Then second, um, point, this, this though is not very restric restrictive because point one is often satisfied in some sense, so uh, one is satisfied by a large class. And to convince you that this is true, I will tell you that, for example, if we take the Borel sigma algebra and T continues, then uh, this implies that T is measurable. So in some sense, uh, there, are, there are uglier transformations, but a lot of natural transformations, and in particular, the ones we, will be, we are thinking about mostly um, this week, they all satisfy point one. Now, whether they satisfy point two or not is what we will see in the examples later, okay? And so a third remark is that um, we want to know if we could use the image instead of the pre-image. It's quite natural to ask. So would it be, would it be the same thing? Would it give the same uh, measure preserving transformation? So is it equivalent? to use measure of T of A equal measure of A for each A and B? Well, the answer is no, and we will see it in an example later in my class. And, but there is a case where this is equivalent, and this, when T is invertible, Then, then this is equivalent to uh, number two. And this will be one of my exercises for this afternoon. And then the last remark remark number four, is that what happens if we take a composition? So we have a transformation from X to X, and then a second transformation from X to X, um, both measurable. And 
and uh, measure preserving. Then what happened when I composed them? Well then, S compose T is also measure preserving. And this is very easy to see just writing down the definition. Okay. So measure preserving transformation are very nice objects and um, we will see some examples very soon. But first, I want to give you uh, another definition that Oliver briefly mentioned yesterday. That is that if we have a transformation, we can basically set ourselves up to have a measure-preserving transformation. So, so the map T star mu from B to R plus union is the push forward measure and is defined as defined as so we need to say what t star mu is on each measurable set. Well, we say that this is the measure of t minus one of a for each a measurable, okay? So, so we have a measure on, on our space and then we want to give another measure on our target space and we pull it back using the transformation. And well, the first thing to do is to prove that, so remarks is that we need t star mu to be a measure, and this also will be one of the exercises. And then, well, I said that we set ourselves up for being measure preserving, and in fact, the point is that D is measure preserving if and only if this term mu equal mu, and to see these one, just write down the definition. So the measure of A, so to be measure preserving, this needs to be the measure of the pre-image. And then, but then by definition of T star, this is exactly T star mu of A. And since this is true for each measurable set, then this means that mu equal T star mu. Okay. But again, checking this measure preserving property on each measurable set is, is kind of hard. We always want to try to restrict the things we need to check as much as we can. So we have also in this case some equivalent of the extension theorem that we had later that says something similar that says that it is enough to check that we are measure preserving on an algebra. So more precisely, 
um, if we have a measure of space and the sigma algebra is generated by an algebra, then T preserves mu if and only if, well, the property that we want um, is true for all A in the algebra now instead of in the whole sigma algebra. So the proof, well, one side is easy because if it's new preserving that this is true for each uh, measurable set, so in particular is true for the, for the algebra. And to prove the other side, we use the extension theorem. So consider t star mu and mu. Well, t star mu restricted to the algebra coincide with mu restricted to the algebra. And then by the extension theorem, um, t star mu restricted to A and mu restricted to A um, extend. Well, here we extend to t star mu. Here we extend to mu. But by uniqueness, those two need to be equal. And t star mu equal mu is equivalent to say that T is measure preserving. And so we're done. Okay. So now we go to the examples. Well, the first example is the doubling map. The superstar for the course from, from Hannah. So we take x, b, and lambda, where x is 0, 1, and then b is the Borel sigma algebra and lambda is the Lebesgue measure. And now we take double map T from X to X. T of X is 2X mod 1 or 2x if we are between 0 and a half, or 2x minus 1 if we are between a half and 1. So we have the, our two branches. And now I tell you, and I sh will show you, that T preserves the Lebesgue measure. So which elements do we need to check? Well, by our new extension theorem, we just need to check an algebra. And an algebra that generates the Borel sigma algebra is finite unions of intervals. So let's first look at intervals. So So if 
x equal r or an interval, then and, and b is the Borel sigma algebra, um, then we want to check it on intervals in R or in I. And, and so in finite union of interval, that is the algebra, and then uh, countable union of intervals, that is the Borel sigma algebra. So let's take our interval AB and, and see what T minus one of AB is. Well, each Y in AB has two per image. And one is uh, one per branch. So one is on Y equal to X, so is the point Y over two. And the other is y equal 2x minus 1, so x equal y plus 1 over 2. And so this means that the pre-image of an interval is two disjoint interval. That I think it's faster if I redraw the graph than if I go down there. So if we take an interval a, b here, then the pre-images will be this piece here and this piece here. So t minus one of AB will be the union of A over two, B over two, and union A plus one over two, B plus one over two. And um, so when we go to calculate the Lebesgue measure of this, well, the Lebesgue measure of, um, of this, since the union is disjoint, then it's the sum of the Lebesgue measure of the two single intervals. And the Lebesgue measure of an interval is, uh, so the Lebesgue measure of AB is B minus A. And so here we will have B over two minus A over two coming from the first one plus B plus one over two minus A plus one over two. So now this half and this half cancel because of the minus. So we remain with B over two plus B over two, that is B minus A over two minus A over two, that is A. And this is exactly the same that we have here. And so it's measure preserving. And now, so if it's true on, on an interval, it's true on, uh, on a finite union of interval, and so by the extension theorem, is true for countable unions of interval. Sorry? Yeah, so we gave this lemma that says that if it's true on an algebra, then it's mu preserving. And finite unions of interval is an algebra that generates the Borel sigma algebra. Sorry? This, well, I just did it. So to prove that this imply this, I just say that if it's true for each element of the sigma algebra, then in particular it's true for the elements of the algebra that generates it, okay? No. So A is contained in B because it's the algebra that generates it. So measure preserving means that mu of t minus one of A 
equal mu of a for each a in B. So in particular, is also true for each a in A, because A is contained in B. OK? And so then that this is exactly this. OK? So one side is proved like this, and the other side, we consider the, the pullback restricted to A, and the measure restricted to A, and then by the Caratteodori extension theorem that, we, that Oliver explained us yesterday, we can extend both of those to a measure. And so when we extend it to these and we extend it to these, but by uniqueness, they need to be the same. And we just said that these imply that it is equivalent to say that we're measure preserving. OK? OK. So here. I want to remark that um, this is an example of why we can't use t instead of, we can't always use t instead of t minus 1 when we um, define measure, measure preserving. So what happens if we use t instead of t minus 1 in the definition of measure preserving, well, if we consider the, the measure of the image of AB, well, if we take already, um, so let's take AB contained in um, 0 half, then already here, the, so, so T of AB is 2A to B, and the Lebesgue measure of this is 2B minus A that is different from B minus A that is the Lebesgue measure of AB. So in this case, if we had taken the images instead of the pre-images, we would have that the doubling map is not measure preserving. So the two things are not equivalent. And in fact, T is not invertible. And we said that when it's invertible, we can take the images. But here is not the case. And in fact, we would attain a different answer to this question, OK? So a second example, rotations. So again, we have our x be lambda with x s1 that is the same as 0, 1 when we identify 0 and 1. And then b is again the Borel sigma algebra. And lambda is again our Lebesgue measure. And then we consider our alpha from S1 to S1, that is the rotation by 2 pi alpha. Now again, we want to check if this is measure preserving or not. So where do we check it? Instead of checking on, on everything, so if x equal s1 and b is the Borel sigma algebra, then it is enough if we check it on arcs. For the same reasons as before.
So, in fact, the Lebesgue measure on S1 is the same as the Lebesgue measure on 0, 1 um, with our identification. And so we want to check it on arcs. And what is the measure of an arc? Well, is the length of the arc um, divided by 2 pi. And we divide it by 2 pi so that the measure of the whole S1 is the same as the measure of 0, 1, that is 1. Because um, if our circle, circle has radius 1, then the length of the whole circumference will be 2 pi. So we divide by 2 pi, and then we're doing the same thing that we were doing in 0, 1. And, and now we remark that if that a rotation is invertible and that the inverse is, a, is another rotation of angle minus alpha. So if the rotation by alpha is uh, counterclockwise, the rotation by minor al minus alpha is uh, a clockwise rotation, but it's still a rotation. And rotations are isometries. in the sense that they preserve arc length. And so the Lebesgue measure of r alpha to the minus 1 of an arc is the same as the Lebesgue measure of r minus alpha of an arc, which is the same as the Lebesgue measure of the arc, because this is a rotation. OK? And so this is also measure preserving. And in fact, our alpha, our alpha is invertible. So we could also consider um, the image of an arc, and that will still be the same as the measure of the arc itself. So in this case, it's equivalent to take images, but that's just because um, the rotation is invertible. Okay, third example. So, so far we always had Lebesgue measure, um, but we could have also other measure, and this is the reason why I gave you earlier the measure with respect to a density. So now, our third example, we take still our interval zero, 01, which we very much like, and still be the Borel sigma algebra. Um, but this time we take the measure defined by the density 1 over x. So this means that our function um, f of x is 1 over x. And as I said at the beginning of my class, this defines a measure that the measure of A is the integral of array so in this case, of 1 over x, dx. And again, since we are in the interval, we said that we can just check it on, on uh, subintervals. intervals 
So, so first, and, um, and now we need to give a transformation. So the transformation is the Faraday map. That is, well, let's call it F from zero one to zero one, defined as follow. So f of x is x over one minus x. If we are between zero and a half, and is x minus one, oh, sorry, one minus x um, over x. If we are between a half and one. So if we plot it, we have our one by one, and we have a half where we have the two branches, and the map is something like this. And so again, let's do like before. We take an interval up here, a, b, well, let's take it lower. So that we can see better what happens. And we see what are the pre-images. So, um, so what is f minus one of a b? So I point y in a b has two pre images again corresponding to inverting each branch. So. In the first branch, then we invert it with x equal y over one plus y, and then the second branch is one minus x over over x. Sorry, and then um, x equal one over one plus y. Um, but now we can see from the picture that if this, is, this point is a over, a over one plus a, then this is b over one plus b. But now this one is one over one plus a, and this one is one over one plus b. So t minus one of the interval a, b is, um, the, the disjoint union of a over one plus a, b over one plus b, union one over one plus b, one over one plus a. So when we try to take the measure, sorry, this is f, yep, of this, well, we need to use our density, so we can, we separate the two integrals, so is the integral from a over one plus a to b over one plus b of one over x dx, plus the same thing between one over one plus b and one over one plus a. And now we know how to integrate one over x. So we know what this is. So this is, so I will, so the, the measure of a b is the integral between a and b of one over x dx. That is the logarithm of b minus the logarithm of a. 
because logarithm of x is a primitive, so we calculate it in the extremities. So this now becomes the logarithm of b over 1 plus b minus the logarithm of a over 1 plus a plus the second part, that is the logarithm of 1 over 1 plus a minus logarithm of 1 over, sorry, this is, yeah, 1 over 1 plus b. And now we remember that the logarithm of a quotient is the difference of the logarithms. So this becomes logarithm of b minus logarithm of 1 plus b minus log of a plus log of 1 plus a plus log 1 minus log of 1 plus a minus log 1 plus log 1 plus b. So we uh, can cancel some terms and this with this. And this is log b minus log a, which was exactly the measure of a b. And this implies, so, so we checked it on intervals. So the same thing can be done on finite unions of intervals. And the finite unions of intervals generate the whole Borel sigma algebra. And so by the lemma that we erased, um, F preserves mu. And in fact, F does not preserve the bag. But if, if we just write it down, then one can see that this is not true, but writing the the back measure here. And I think it's time to stop. Yeah? <laughs>